So I, I feel like I should start with some caveats. Uh, we were just talking a moment ago about recording and how we feel about recording. And I was mentioning to Beck that I'm having conversations I haven't had in over a decade, maybe two decades. People are nervous about sharing things online because of AI and the sort of lawlessness of what it's doing with content, what it's not doing with any kind of attribution or um, provenance of ideas. So it's an interesting space to be a graduate student in as well, because um, there's also this fear of um, having to be completely individualistic and um, unique in whatever it is that I'm presenting or researching and the the fear of it having been done before. And, you know, all of these graphics that show the stages of um, sort of mental health or lack thereof in the PhD process. So um, hopefully that situates me pretty well in explaining uh, where I am. Um, and I have some slides. I don't know how committed I am to sharing them, but I, I'll share them. But I don't really feel I worry about slides um, becoming the focus of things. And I'm really keen on you all picking apart or not even picking apart. I just would love your comments because, um, as many of you know, doing a thesis is a pretty lonely experience. And it's not an experience where I have a ton of feedback. I was just watching Maha Bali's uh, presentation on Gojian about um, self and about tweeting and blogging as she went through her PhD. The times have changed for us on social media, haven't they? The, the open ed community used to be really active and really um, vocal on Twitter. Of course, now we feel like we've lost some of that. Something happened socially also with the pandemic. So we're at a funny time and it, it feels it. Um, anyway, I'm not committed to this title just yet. To be honest, I want people who find uh, the word inclusive or inclusion triggering to read this. So I've got to figure out a way to make this sound like it's something they might be interested in um, without turning them off. Because I, I actually agree in many ways that we've made a bit of a mess of some of the terms that are now getting politicized um, and, and used against the sort of causes of openness and of inclusion and of diversity by leaving them very um, amorphous and, and, and sort of they can mean anything to anyone. So the problem space that, that I feel like I've identified is in the field of education and also educational design um, that we talk about these two things that feel as though they're on um, sort of the edges of some, some linear spectrum. On the one hand is the tactical or things like universal design for learning, you know, make sure that you can read, you can see, you can understand the content. Um, and then the socio-emotional where we talk about things like pedagogy of care, pedagogy of um, uh, 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 trauma um, and, and, and things that feel like partial pedagogies and awarenesses of social justice issues like systemic racism um, and uh, sexism, all the isms. But it seems as though we talk about those in the abstract. So what I'm contending is that we're missing something really rich in the middle. And um, what I worry about is that the middle is where a lot is going on. So I, this, this, uh, this GIF means nothing other than there's a dynamism to this. I've struggled with how to um, visualize it, but and, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I think just to know that there's a dynamism, people are not simple. They're not two-dimensional. I would argue that understanding them is not even three-dimensional. Like, um, I was sort of inspired by the Tesseract and the idea of this fourth dimension. Um, and some people thought it was a, a call out to the movie Interstellar. It wasn't. But having said that, Kip Thorne, a Nobel laureate and theoretical physicist, actually did a lot of the science on Interstellar. And just this week, NASA released a picture of um, large amounts of um, matter being shot out of the center of a black hole. So we've got these images that show the kind of complexity that I think exists. 
Of course, in teaching, we focus on knowledge or skills and character or attitude. Um, those don't map nicely or neatly. And that's the point of this, this infographic or this dynamic graphic is that these things don't map. And we are left with tools like the ones I'm using that, that encourage us to do this mapping. So as much of the mapping as I feel comfortable is here and talking about Obviously, knowledge is in domain knowledge, questioning and unlearning and ethics. Skills are in creating brave spaces, harnessing the power of nuance, um, embracing uncertainty and incompletion, and participating in community of practice. Those are largely the skills that I'm teaching in my graduate program, um, in my graduate course in uh, inclusive design, in the inclusive design master's program. So the thesis is focusing on the class that I teach in that program. The character attitude socio-emotional is, is, I call it the backpack we all carry, our ancestors, our pasts, our um, hopes and dreams, our negative experiences, our positive experiences, you know, all of the things that we carry with us, um, feeling belonging or lack thereof, all the experiential stuff, and then the individual situatedness and positionality obviously fits into this. So my research question is really, can I articulate this pluralistic pedagogical approach using an inclusive design lens that addresses the full self and prioritizes uh, individual student voices outcomes and really as the measure of success of teaching and learning. So that's a mouthful. So in 12 weeks, I teach this course and we um, use the inclusive design thinking sort of the perspective shift that we get from that, that I've been talking about in conferences for years to uh, sort of reconceptualize what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we're doing it. So there's this aspect of unlearning. And there's also an aspect of disrupting event, which takes me squarely in the direction of Jack Mesereau, um and other people talking about transformative education and adult learners. I have some disagreements with some of the things that um, he's put together, but a lot of what I do, it turns out, is very much uh, in line with that. And um, we do a sort of rebuilding of a new self where people can have these transformative moments. They aren't mandated. It's not the sort of thing I can script. It's not the sort of thing that I can predict. Um, but it, it's through this practice, this framing of how we do this uh, course that it happens. And then something that I've put together called that I call the QRD framing. And it's a pluralistic approach to exploring pretty much anything. Um, and rather than sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, as we do in academia, throwing out the ideological approaches that came before, um, it's an interest in bringing what's positive from all of those together and questioning, reflecting, and disrupting on pretty much the design of anything. So what I think is happening is uh, for some students, transformation. For others, there is this path from self to other that is the experience of inclusion. And this is where that word just gets used, but nobody knows how to action it. So the way that I've sort of thought about it is we have this now, we have these um, sort of false dichotomy on this uh, kind of uh, continuum. And in the middle, what we have is like a practice or an application on both sides. And this is where we see things like pedagogy of equity, pedagogy of care, pedagogy of trauma. And we build in the elements of care and justice in the actioning of both of these things. So the tactical of UDL is not in and of itself an act of care. The application of it to an individual who needs it before they ask for it, before they have to, you know, beg for it is an act of care. So it's in the in the actioning of these things. The reaching out to the one racialized student in a sea of white faces is not um, in and of itself, or, or the noticing of a, a racialized student is not in and of itself actioning something like a pedagogy of care and and equ equity in education, which we talk about. So from this, I think that what, what is happening in the class is we're doing this from the perspective of uh, people understanding self and then extending it to others, which makes this silly little chart. I've got to change the way it looks because it looks too silly, like it's a little bit of a robotic smiley face. But I think it's when we connect these two things, self and other, 
that we actually find we're doing the work of inclusion. And what I mean there is that maybe somewhat paradoxically, inclusion starts with self and then it becomes an extension to others. Um, the methods that I'm using, this is sort of forcing me to speak in this language that I'm pretty uncomfortable speaking in still, but semi-structured interviews, which means I'm having conversations <laughs> with former students, um, reflexive thematic analysis, which I take to mean that I can do iterative coding that lets the taxonomy emerge and flex. And I'm I'm troubled by that because I'm making the taxonomy and, and making these decisions are acts of power over something and, and their design decisions. And then <clears throat> adding in the methodology of interpretive phenomenological analysis, which I think is kind of cute because it sounds like a beer, an IPA, and it, it helps to not lose the I in the work of inclusion, which I think is sometimes misunderstood that inclusion means somehow diminishing self. So, you know, I've been doing, I, I don't know if everybody knew, but you can do animated GIFs and PowerPoint, and this is a dinosaur, just, just brings me happiness. But um, I've been doing coding and rearranging the coding and feeling a little bit like a, a an imposter and uh, a fake because I'm making the taxonomy. I'm doing it completely individually not in in uh, conjunction with people, and that feels somehow false. Uh, and I wanted to figure out a way to represent this visually as an ode to sort of multimodal approaches. And two of the conversations with my former students, we talked about Hero's Journey, which I thought was really kind of a kismet moment because it came up independently twice. But I looked at the starburst. What I love about the starburst, though, is the missing pieces. And then I went to a radar chart and you can see here, here are some of the people that I've talked to. Now the mapping, like, the problem is the mapping is meaningless. It, all it says is it's a subjective taxonomy, subjective coding, my interpretation of what's going on here. And um, not to be concluded in any way other than each person has their own unique constellation. And this represents a point in time T where we're talking about these issues. And like I said, I struggle with the with the ways to uh, represent it. This is the NASA, um, the matter being thrown out of the black hole on the upper right. On the upper left is just a tesseract. And then uh, the bottom sort of connected dots or networks. What what really appeals to me is something like this piece by Julie Moretu. It's called Entropia. So it, it's it's a place where entropy happens is how I interpret that. But you can see if you look very closely, there's grid on the on the bottom, on the back. There's this act of dimensionality, this dynamism. There's order. There's disorder. They're layered in complexity, and I, I feel as though that's what's happening in the classroom. So what I and showing in what I'm writing is that there are real ways that we can architect and design our teaching and learning environments um, so that the opportunity for transformation is available. And it requires all of these things like decentering the pedagogue um, and really focusing on individuals. And that is a starting place toward inclusion and toward community. Um, and we can also teach and learn with our whole selves in this productive, critical, brave spaces. That is that whole continuum and the the false dichotomy that is the tactical or the socio-emotional at the expense of everything in between. And then there's this part of me that feels as though I have to write a disclaimer because the act of writing this thesis has been a series of minor decisions or major decisions, but design decisions that I've been making. I decided on the research question. I decided on the taxonomy and how to do this. I decided on the research methods. I am doing, you know, this work in in um, a very sort of, you know, the, the rugged individual of the academy, not to um, talk too much to anybody else. Um, so there's a part of me that wants very much to represent that and to, oops, and to show that I am, I am very much, um, subjectively approaching this and trying to explain in this class, this is what I'm seeing. 
some students are having transformational events. Um, and that seems like a, a moment that is worth exploring further. Thank, thank you. Yeah, this is a uh, this is the um, the name of of the presentation I made to um, present myself and my research to this uh, great network. I'm honored to be part of today, and uh, also in the future. Um, a little uh, presentation about myself. <laughs> Sorry, I have too many rooms open. Uh, my name is Giacomo Vincenzi. I'm a PhD candidate of uh, philosophy. Um, the the program I'm I'm studying is uh, on uh, um, it's a doctoral program called Philosophy, Science, Cognition, and Semiotics, and uh, especially the the, the curriculum uh, I'm in is uh, it's the semiotics uh, curriculum. The area is uh, open education, digital inclusion, and innovative spaces for learning. And my project, the project title is uh, Open Educational Resources and Learning Processes for an epistemology of context. And um, I want to say that the PhD I'm doing is co-funded by Archilabo, which is a non-for-profit uh, organization I have been working for in the past, uh, let's say, 12 years, I think, so far. And uh, it's, a, it's an organization that works in the field of education, especially inclusive education, because we uh, deal uh, with uh, <clears throat> special needs uh, students, um, students with uh, dyslexia and um, and other other kind of uh, um, condition that uh, may uh, hinder their uh, development of uh, knowledge and competence. Um, uh, yeah, uh, let's move on. Otherwise, I won't be able to go through uh, my presentation. This is the overview uh, of what I'm gonna uh, talk about. Um, um, I apologize, I um, I think that I may say things that are obvious <laughs> to you, um, uh, but I think it won't be too um, boring <laughs> anyways. Um, I have, uh, um, but these, uh, these uh, reflections, these thoughts are, needed to my research to <clears throat> create a, a framework uh, of, of research and uh, analysis. So uh, I really need to <laughs> um, talk a little bit about them. Uh, first of all, the definition, uh, definition of open educational resources, then uh, how OERs are, uh, are in, fact, in fact, for me, uh, practices and relate uh, to context. Um, how OERs are interactive learning resources and how we should uh, analyze them. Uh, this is what I'm trying to do, among other learning resources and, and why. And then uh, a brief uh, uh, overview on the research that I am going to uh, carry out in the next month uh, in some Italian schools with the collaboration of uh, some uh, teachers that I'm uh, that I'm in touch with, so uh, this is uh, something that I really um, I'm going to uh, to do in the in the very next future. And uh, uh, so I, I want to I want to show you uh, what it's in my mind. And um, okay, let's move on. Uh, I think, uh, as I said before, that we all uh, know or have an idea on uh, about what uh, open education means. Um, we all know, I think, that it's still uh, it's going to be like this forever. Uh, very to be very difficult to find agreement on a single broadly accepted and shared uh, definition of this field and. Uh, um, I've read openings like this in a great number of papers so far, and I agree to all of them <laughs> uh, in as much as I'm compelled to open up my presentation in this way. Um, first of all, um, I have uh, I want to notice that um, how the adjective open is paired with different nouns at times, 
suggesting a different interest or uh, coverage of the research um, that employs the term. And this reflection is not mere speculation of the vocabulary, but uh, it substantiates, let's say so, uh, the research itself so that every work in the field of open education has to choose a method to define and consequentially study the object of its research. And my own research too, uh, for this very reason, has gone through a process of selection and choice of the field of research, uh, of the interest within that field, of the objects to take into account, and of the perspective from which I'm to behold them. Uh, by this process, of, I came to the idea that the semiotic object that suits my goals best is, um, let's call it open educational resources, OER, insofar as it necessarily drags under the lens of investigation the context from time to time relating to the specific resource used or examined. Once the semiotic object is stated, I take into account the definitions available, and, uh, and this is where I'm now. I choose the combination, say so, of, uh, of some definition, um, especially the, the, com the combination of the definition provided by UNESCO 2012, together with uh, David Wiley's five R's, and uh, the definition used by Creative Commons and the Hewlett Foundation that uh, basically uh, uh, rely um, while is uh, definition. Um, I am also, and I, I want to say this, um, I, I'm also aware that there are criticism uh, to these definitions. Um, since as far as I know, these criticisms have to do more with the methodological nature of the recognition itself of a prominent, prominence of criteria over others or over any criteria, <clears throat> sorry, at all. Um, I shall now leave uh, out of the scope of my research uh, the, uh, a deeper, um, a deeper uh, reflection on these criticism and on the, these definitions. Although, uh, although I can well understand uh, why and, <clears throat> sorry, and how criticism arise. And the main reason a reason, in, in, at least in my, in my, my opinion, lies in the tension, uh, which is a positive and enriching tension, I think, uh, the tension between formalization of methods and pure activism in the open education mood. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, in choosing to rely on Wiley's definition and the combinations uh, of it, um, I am pointing towards the analysis of OERs, uh, not as mere uh, single entities, but at necessary open educational practices, limited to Wiley's definition of open pedagogies. Um, I made this choice following the comparative analysis that uh, Cronin and McLaren uh, gave uh, in a 2018 paper. Um, therefore, following then uh, Wiley and Hilton paper on ped pedagogies enabled by open educational resources, uh, is established an essential pragmatism of OER, uh, which is defined by Wiley through uh, necessarily proactive affordances, uh, which are uh, the so-called so five R's activities. The object of our research <clears throat> is therefore a resource, a text, an object, definable only through the practices that involve it. Semiotics of the text and semiotics of the practice of using that text come close to each other to the point of becoming confused. This is why the reason to distinguish between a semiological or a semiotic uh, approach in dealing with open educational resources also falls away. But uh, I think it is, uh, looks like a continental uh, dispute or uh, that mm, I, don't, I don't even know if it's uh, relevant uh, in, 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 our, um, in our reflection here. Uh, an open educational resource is a sign in the person sense of the term reported by ECHO, 
as that which always makes us know something more. This is the definition that uh, ECO provides. Uh, relating to pairs, of course, it is a text that refers to a meaning through an interpreter. But the essential characteristic of an OER in inextricably linked to a practice that is to a sequence of actions organized in various ways that configure through a causal relationship a different one, identified with the noun of learning. This action subsumes then, subsumes all the actions performed before. Learning, uh, if we take the dictionary, uh, is the acquisition of one or more theoretical or practical knowledge. Or uh, we find definitions such as act of learning, of acquiring knowledge, or process of acquiring new behavior, behavioral models, or, or of modifying previous ones for a better adaptation of the individual to the environment. Or uh, in a dictionary, for instance, uh, the definition um, of learning is acquisition of knowledge capable of changing a person's way of acting. So uh, considering learning as an act art articulated through different actions of a process, we can, which can therefore be schematized, that is, we, we can recognize its multiple and repetitive occurrences in a practice, we are uh, pushed towards the semiotics of Fontanille. Um, so Fontanille semiotics of practices is uh, taken uh, into account uh, uh, here. Um, this encounter is further and reci reciprocally prompted by the consideration that in interpreting or understanding a text, one, one person inevitably draws on an availability of discourses what something that Fontani calls the discursive thickness um, enclosed in the body of the enunciative extent. In this body, uh, we found fragmented uh, potential and virtual text that condense um, uh, combining the, to each other. Um, and in, in this thickness, the reader learner handles on a plane of immanence that is not that the, the same plane, the same uh, uh, layer of immanence of the text, but uh, as Fontani says, uh, the, 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 the level of practices. So th this is why uh, we are uh, taken uh, into the uh, semiotics of practices rather than just the semiotics of text when we deal with uh, open, open educational resources. Now I want to uh, take into into account the, um, the OERs uh, and the other learning resources. Um, I think it's important uh, for for all of us, for all, for everyone who uh, uh, who gets closer to uh, not only to uh, OERs but also to every sort of. Um, uh, teaching methodology uh, and learning uh, uh, methodology. Um, it's important to, uh, to be faithful to a neutral approach to the nature of learning resources. That is to say, an approach that encompasses different types of learning resources into the same analysis. Uh, this is uh, because this reflects best the way students and people in general acquire knowledge both in and out of school, that is to say, again, in different contexts. So we, uh, we, we, we replicate the way people uh, uh, actually uh, get to know something this way. It would not be fair nor realistic to limit students' sources to closed textbooks, neither to adequately open resources, nor to uh, proprietary but free ones, uh, because knowledge manifests itself somehow, somehow, regardless of the kind of resources that learners rely on. If this wasn't the case, we wouldn't have communication at all. Uh, as a side note, I want to 
point out that this also means that we need to have a neutral approach to teaching methodologies, ensuring freedom of teaching, which is regarded by the teachers as one of the most valuable features of the work. Uh, I know this because of uh, um, because I, I, I held myself um, uh, some uh, um, uh, teachers training courses uh, over the past years. So um, advocates of open educational uh, open education processes, as well as trainers and curriculum designers, must accept the possibility, if not the necessity, to measure and confront their beliefs and values about teaching with others. And this applies whenever we seek innovation in teaching, which cannot be an empty goal uh, per se. This, uh, this approach should lead to an objective evaluation of the forms of interpretations performed by students, which is learning processes that involve OERs as the, uh, as the object of my research. The open educational resources that I take into consideration are digital multimedia text. This means that their very structure is hypertextual, and because of it, following what Landos says in hypertext, um, and what, what then Alessandro Zina says in his book, uh, they are essentially interactive. Digital OERs allow active learning because they are, they are hypertext, hence interactive. And they allow active learning in many, many ways. They are accessed to, used, and understood by means of a broad range of actions, and these latter are relevant to the extent that we can consider them affordances of the open resources themselves. My purpose is then to deepen the meaning of this latter statement. What does it mean to learn in many ways? It is necessary to analyze what kind of knowledge of interpretation of assignment of meaning occurs because of the characteristics of OERs. Then one must compare these uh, different semiosis to the epistemology or uh, interpretation of closed or traditional resources protected by copyright and allowing or requiring a narrower set of actions by the learner. The hypothesis I put forward is that the more the permissions of Wiley's five R's are explicit, incorporated, and advanced towards the user or learner by the affordances of a resource, the more the semiosis will be different from that of a resource protected by copyright. Thus, with a greater variety of ways of constructing the meaning, the epistemology or interpretation of OER is more suitable or effective for contextualizing individualizing or developing the learner's personal skills compared to copyrighted resources or objects. <clears throat> um, of course, as I said before, I am I'm, I'm looking to uh, Wiley's and Hilton's Defining OER Enabled Pedagogy, a paper of 2018, where the authors define um, with the term OER Enabled Pedagogy all those teaching and learning practices possible only in the context of the five R's that identify an educational resource as open. The five R's activities, also called five R permissions, were defined by Wiley in 2014, expanding a previous definition. Um, Wiley had uh, initially identified four activities as essential to identify an educational resource as open. And uh, the activities to which he refers are, in all respect, affordances, allowances, or disposition for use, which is relational, relational potential of the resources, object, or objects, uh, with the users who encounter them and relate to them. These are um, uh, the reuse, which is understood as the right to use the content in a variety of ways. Uh, revise as the right to modify and adapt content, a remix uh, uh, to the right to combine content with other material, redistribute the right to share and distribute copies of the original content, revisions or recombination of it. And uh, Wiley has then uh, later added the fifth uh, activity as retain, uh, which is the right to create and own copies of the content. 
the five R's are uh, pragmatic and ergonomic properties that establish an action inscribed in the form of the learning resource. This is the uh, how uh, this mm, definition that OER defines defined this way are um, uh, have affordances uh, in a in a semiotic sense. Uh, to establish a causal link between openness and quality of learning, uh, which is partially, partially a goal of my research, um, uh, while in Hilton first defined the connection between pedagogy and copyright, the authors uh, accept the postulate that learning occurs by doing. Uh, we accept as axiomatic that students learn by doing, they're right. And this assumption appears, in fact, justified in the light of scientific research on education and training, to which we must necessarily refer. However, we, if we want to treat the fact of learning as a semiotic practice, and again, uh, I refer to uh, Fontanilla uh, terminology, in as much as the focus of, of my analysis is not on the text, uh, but rather on the relations and the consistent and subsequent actions that users do on the text and with the text, um, the statement itself may seem to re require a deepening. Uh, in the practice of learning, actions happen, and this is a fact. The doing necessarily take place. The actions implicitly referred to in the expression learning by doing are, um, as I called, endotropic or endotextual actions. That is, actions that configure an activity of the subject who learns directly on the resource of learning. Since copyright limits the possible actions on and with a given resource, therefore forcing users or learners to perform uh, exotropic or exotextual actions, it follows then that copyright also limits learning. This is the, um, th this is the argument. Uh, uh, carried out by um, Wiley, Wiley and Hilton. Um, furthermore, as pointed out by uh, Zinna uh, 2004, in speaking of the learner's activity in the learning process, the element of interactivity that he undertakes with a hypertextual resource must be considered. Interactivity is the constitutive property of hypertext. Uh, the most general property that seems to be constitutive of a hypertext is precisely that of compo composing sorry, both textual elements and commands. This property is ultimately interactivity. Lando then in his work list, listed other characteristics, which are um, multilinearity, multisequentiality, uh, network uh, writing, and uh, the centrality of the reader as uh, um, the essential characteristics for hypertext. Um, Zinna disputed the essentiality uh, of them, but uh, this doesn't really matter to our research insofar as um, they both configure an active role for the reader of a hypertextual resource. And this is, uh, I think, uh, central to my research and also to uh, all of us in a, in a way. Um, then uh, I, I will try to uh, rapidly uh, show you uh, the idea about the research that uh, I want to carry out. Um, uh, the research methodology is going, is, this is going to be a, a qualitative uh, research carried out through observations and interviews. And the research is going to take place through the delivery of three different learning units, supported by different uh, study resources within the same class in the two to four uh, middle and high school classes. Um, I'm still uh, not certain on how many uh, classes I, um, I will be able to uh, cover. Um, we are, we are taking agreements with the schools in these uh, days. Um, the difference, and this is the, the, the central point of, uh, of my um, methodology of research, is, is the differences um, between uh, study resources. 
which I describe as following. Um, three types, uh, learning by uh, closed resources, um, unaware learning by open resources, and aware learning by open resources. So these uh, three different uh, types of uh, activities related to different study resources. Um, um, I want also to say um, that I believe that the learning outcome, which is the fact that students learn something through these activities, has to be measured by practices of traditional evaluation, for instance, with uh, tests. Um, but at the stage of, of design of the process of research, I think it's worth comprising into the notion of learning not only the correspond correspondence between what is asked by the teacher and what is answered by the learner, but whatever notion is retain retained by the learner and skill or competence uh, uh, developed, regardless of its uh, centrality to the evaluation method. Um, this approach considers both teaching and learning as hypothetical, uh, which means that uh, we can define uh, teaching and learning only at the end of a set, certain set of practices, at the end of one or more activities carried out by the two different actors, uh, the, um, the teacher and the learner in a learning context. Uh, therefore, we develop uh, a possible research methodology um, with three different teaching and learning activities uh, designed for um, each participant class. Um, uh, I, I actually prefer the, the term uh, teachers activities and learners activities because of the uh, hypothetical nature of, of teaching and learning, as I just said. Um, these um, these activities are going to be carried out at different times of the school year. The period is going to be roughly uh, between December and March uh, by the same class or a group of students. And to prevent possible biases uh, due to the order in which um, the different practices are used, I have decided to ask teachers to perform the activities in different order among the different different classes and carrying out all three types of activities with different classes should um, in any case reduce or normalize let's say so any bias bias uh, judgment uh, and therefore return hopefully um, a genuine evaluation with respect to the students perception of their learning if possible, I don't exclude to repeat the observation with the same class, per, perhaps with a different order of activity. Um, during the activities, the actions performed by the students in realizing their path, path of construction of meaning uh, will be recorded by me uh, and uh, or other observators. At the end of the activities, qualitative research will be carried out through interviews uh, with the uh, both students and teachers involved. So my name is Gela Rekeshavarz. I'm a doctoral student at Atabasca University. I'm I'm a doc I'm studying Doctor of Education in Distance Education. It's only my third term, so I am well behind our presenters. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is basically I'm talking to you and I'm asking for your feedback to make sure the story that I'm making in my head is something that is researchable and it can work as my proposal. Um, so it's an ever-changing proposal for now. But it is actually my own lived experience that I want to know if it is shared with other people. Um, the title of the research is Explore the Lived Experience of Higher Education Faculty in Canada, Rwanda, Kenya, who speak English as a second language and utilize AI tools to enhance their professional capital and capabilities. I will explain this capital and capabilities, and um, it just through my travels, I have friends and scholars in these countries, and they don't speak English as a first language, and I thought, That'll be nice to together we can research our journey. 
Um, please, at any moment, just um, ask any question because we may not have time in the end, so I can just clarify as we go through. Um, so this is me. I'm an ESL, uh, uh, trained as an ESL lecturer. I started my teaching career in London, UK, some 18 years ago, moved to Canada 17 years ago. From an ESL teacher, I became, became an instructional designer, education developer, and now I'm a learning consultant. And learning consultant means really I don't know what comes at me and I don't know which expertise that I have I should use to solve the problem that the stakeholder has. So I don't go in with a lot of expertise. I go in with the skills that I have and I sharpen them toward their need. Uh, and there isn't really a big onboarding for becoming a consultant. So I think I am doing okay. And I owe part of it to AI that is helping me as someone who doesn't have, well, see, I don't have a big family who went to university in Canada. Basically, you don't have anybody in Canada. I just have my husband who didn't go to university in Canada. He went to university in Turkey. Um, and it's kind of, if you think of the community support is not huge. That's what we're talking about. LinkedIn and Twitter and the books have been my community support. And it's interesting that we talked about how things have changed since we lost our uh, support. So AI has been my collaborative partner. Um, so there are lots of metaphors about AI as a naive coworker, an expert coworker, um, someone who is there. So basically, I am working with that person who is there, and I want to know if my experience is shared with other people who have my profile. Um, for making this presentation, I use Grammarly, ChatGPT, and Claude. You know, we're talking about, I, I noticed that I can't really say things as concisely as I want as an ESL um, background. And I want to be published. I want to be coded. And I think Grammarly, honestly, is doing great and it's helping me a lot. So Chat, GPT and Claude, I'll tell you how I'm, I've used them for this presentation and my other work in a minute. I use Gamma. I use um the free version, I, use, I try to use the free version of everything, but for this particular presentation last, yes, last night, because I noticed I need to make some editing and I'm running out of my free space, I paid $10 and I got the pro one. I use Synthesia, Synthesia and I use Notebook LM. These are the AIs I am playing with right now. So I the part of the story started reading from reading the skill code by Matt Bean, who talks about this AI human relationship and UNESCO framework for um, um, teachers. Sorry, I just can't remember the title. The title is AI competency framework for teachers by UNESCO that talks about how the dynamic is changing from student teacher we have student teacher ai and matt bean who talks about novice expert relationship and the the collaboration we can have with ai to improve teaching and learning so i think as a woman who want to move from esl to leadership i needed some help and i Think this is a great professional development tool for me and if it is great professional development tool for me maybe it can be for my student so it has a transformative potential but i just the first step is to learn and then judge so i am right now i am sorry i am at the learning stage um profession a bit of a definition professional capability and i um to understand professional capability, I mm, reference to Ute Goji. It is in my reference list. Sorry that I don't remember the name of the writer. Um, cap and um, trans professional capability can be enhancing skills, time management, and other techniques. And then I 
I'm referring to Michael Fullans, the previous dean of Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, that um, talks about um, professional capital, which he divides it to human, social, and decisional capital. Human capital um, teaches us how to invest in the talents that we already have. Social capital um, refers to leveraging the network to amplify ability, and decisional capital is making better informed judgment. Now I'm learning with gamma, maybe moving slide to slide that is not that easy. So um, reading again the skill code brought something to my mind, and that's not the zone of proximal development is not openly mentioned in the skill code, but that's the relationship I made in my head that, you know, if Vygotsky says uh, in the presence of someone, we can learn better. Um, so that's someone there. I don't really think that someone has to be an expert. Not everyone grows up with a mother who is a professor at university. They're alcoholic mothers too, but then kids don't necessarily turn alcoholic. So we have parents and we have sometimes no choice to love them. And then in the presence of them, the support of them, we have done things. So I'm thinking of this role of AI and human. I don't know which one is the novice and which one is the expert. There are times when it comes to language and editing, um, uh, AI can be the expert, but when it comes to evaluating what comes out of it, I am the expert because I do not trust the APA reference that AI gives me. I know it and I quickly check it, but it does save me a lot of time when I ask that to help me. So, and as this technology is trained gradually to think like a human, um, it becomes a better partner. So this is how I think um, it, a, AI can be a partner in my learning. In my learning, so I'm trying to take control of my learning. So learning AI literacy, learning about prompt engineering is what I do on my own because there isn't any training in colleges and universities that I teach or I, I'm a learning consultant. There's a lot of expectation, but not a lot of training. And I'm going to digress a little bit from here very quickly that I noticed in AI competency framework for teachers, there's a lot of emphasis on teachers evaluating the ethics. And I think that is an unrealistic expectation from teachers because we are not an expert in judging, you know, making sense of ethical issues in terms of politics and technology. So I think I need to learn. I That is my responsibility. For that, I'm going to show you a something, a practice I did myself. So I took um, uh, knowledge building. It's an article with um, that I liked, and I wanted to share the article with my class, but I decided to make a good lesson out of it. Um, my class is a um, undergrad class. So it's interesting that, you know, the kind of difference between our students and us as is becoming less. So something that I made for them is actually useful for myself. So I just, I broke down the prompt to task introduction. Ah, oh, I think I should have put change this to the topic. Content, reason and clarification and refinement. That's what I'm learning with, with working with AI. Um, I give more clarification and I ask AI if it has any question from me and I know nothing is concise and the language is super inflated and formal. So I'm training my AI to work the way I want to work with. I have this from um, Deborah, Barbara Oakley that you may know from Learning How to Learn. She recently had a video explaining how we learn is very similar to how chat GPT uh, works. And she said, whatever metaphor we have for AI is going to disappear. And it may have, um, uh, I think Fruz said that it may have 
ethical issues. Um, so the the metaphor. So I, I borrowed that slide from her. So the metaphor that I'm using is a naive coworker, um, but I need that naive coworker because I can bounce ideas back. We can, and a naive coworker means to help. So um, I think that's a very good one. That I, if I am don't don't learn it, there's a possibility that I am replaced. I use that at work and I have made this for myself, acknowledgement and transparency disclaimer that in any work that I do, um, I write and I share. Sile, I, I probably need a second to read this or I can just read it for you. It's just uh, being honest about the fact that I'm not very visually creative and these tools help me with my productivity. So I just want to quickly, and these are my references, I'm gonna move a screen very quickly and then tell you, this is another, the, the presentation you noticed was made by Gamma. So I just want to tell you, this is a kind of thing I am doing with it. When I say it can improve my professional capability and capital, this is the example. So I uploaded, the article that is, um, I don't know if you can see, it is um, by Scardamalia, Teachers as Designers in Knowledge Building and Innovative Network. This is the article that I really like and I wanted my student to learn and read and then discuss, but then it's too dry. So I uploaded that, the, the uh, article is here. I turn the, you know this, you probably have used notebook LM, LM, ethical issues aside that always can be discussed, but I uploaded this dry um, article and in two seconds, two seconds, the most engaging, unbelievable uh, podcast came out, had the right amount of sizzle and steak. It was unbelievable. So I... Um, Gamma summarized the article. I went through the language and improved it a little bit. Um, I put some of the parts that I wanted. I uploaded it on Synthesia and just to dig a little bit deeper into the subject if people want to listen to the story. Um, so the this is the introduction. I mean, if people want to just listen to the whole story is there, but this is this I introduced the subject, the learning objectives of the lesson are here. Um, the definition of the knowledge building and the key feature of the of the article are all here. The key principles of knowledge building came out in two seconds. And after I read the article, I improved a few points because I think it the AI doesn't know this repetition is there for a reason. So I changed that. So I, I the editing, the whole thing takes a lot of time. Um, then how technology can be used. That's an important part of the article. I brought that. So there are implementation tips, how this theory can actually move into practice in the classroom. And then here is my reference here. I have gamma, how I used it. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see if we can. This is, if I go to cloud, oh, Claude. I think now I'm learning, but when I share, things don't happen. So the prompt that I gave to Claude is here. I want to share the screen very quickly and show you the prompt is here. Can you still see my screen? We can, yeah, thanks. Great. So this is the prompt I learned to give to Claude, and that's the part that you notice in the other presentation. I broke it down to title, uh, topic, clarification, and a specific information that I wanted. So I have all that clearly on my thing. I, I sh showed how I used Notebook and Synthesia and... Um, I, yeah, that, that is how I think and I believe 
AI can support, and it's a professional development tool, especially if you're a woman, if you're a second language learner, if you don't have a huge network of support. And I want to know if this is if this idea is shared with other people. Thank you very much.